Uh, U.S. Army Regiment in World War II is a couple thousand, maybe 3,000 men. Now, the, how, how many is that in the context of the Battle for Guadalcanal? Both sides had been landing reinforcements. Uh, by and large, Americans during the day and the Japanese at night, uh, and it had been a company, 100 or 200 men at a time, maybe a battalion, six or 700 men at a time. And here, the United States had landed a major chunk of an infantry, U.S. Army Infantry Division, 3,000 men over the course of a couple of days after the Battle of Cape Esperance. Now, what that meant is the Japanese were no longer really able to contest the island in any reasonable fashion. When I say contest the island, I, I mean launching a drive for the single worthwhile target on the island of Guadalcanal, and that is the airfield just uh, just uh, off the northern coast. You, when, when you land in Guadalcanal from the north, you hit an airfield within a few miles. And that's so-called so Henderson Field. Well, the Japanese had a different name for it. We, we, once we seized it, renamed it Henderson Field. Since the Japanese were no longer able to contest the Battle of Henderson Field, I think you can say that their, their time was up on Guadalcanal. Now, not that they left immediately, and in fact, uh, it would take a long time and some much hard fighting. As I heard from my father, again, he was a medic, so he had really horrible stories to tell. There's going to be a lot of hard fighting before the Japanese are ready to leave Guadalcanal, but, but their chances of taking back the island, for which they would have had to seize the airfield, have now been pretty much, uh, uh, pretty much ended. Now, uh, by the way, I should mention this. Some Japanese soldiers didn't come out of Guadalcanal until the 1960s and 70s. So, right. so we, when we say, when did Japanese resistance cease? Organized resistance is the term we use. Now, individual resistance could go on for quite some time in a shocking fashion. So what does that add up to? The Battle of Guadalcanal uh, is impressive enough on its own. So uh, the, the, the victory at Guadalcanal punched the first hole in Japan's defense perimeter. Uh, combined with the disaster at sea the Japanese Navy had suffered in June 1942, just a few months ago at Midway, uh, it meant that Japan had lost the initiative in the Pacific War. Uh, initiative, you can't, you can't bottle it or see it or touch it or taste it, but initiative is everything in military operations. It means you do what you want and you force the adversary to respond. Uh, you, you don't, you're not in reactive mode, constantly you know, moving left because that's what they've done, then you gotta move right, you're, you're, you're getting run ragged across the map. Initiative is crucial. You choose your targets and you force the enemy to dance to your tune. And once you have initiative, the, the thing you wanna do is keep it. So it was clear, if you add up Midway and then you add up Guadalcanal, it, it was clear that the tide, if you will, in the Pacific War had now, uh, changed and American forces were going to be clearly moving on to the offensive in the upcoming months. Japan's entire naval strategy was based on a single notion, and that was once they had conquered this huge Pacific Empire, all these island bastions which formed their defense perimeter, Americans would be unwilling to batter their way across the world's largest ocean to do anything about it. Uh, U.S. forces would either be unable or, or, uh, or unwilling to do it, and the American people wouldn't stand for it. No, president, no American president could get the American people to, 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 to expend their sons uh, across one unpronounceable island after the other, places that most Americans had never heard of and certainly couldn't identify on a map. My father tells a different story. Where are we going? They're on the, they're on the ship out to the Pacific. They're here. They're going to Guadalcanal. And a lot of guys on the island weren't quite exactly sure what that meant. It sounded like a canal. So not an island in the south in the Solomon's chain in the in the South Pacific. So Americans proved something on Guadalcanal that they were willing to batter their way through an island defense and to fight a very gritty battle to hold on against what often were superior Japanese forces, at least in the initial uh, the initial American landing. That undercut the entire basis of the, of the uh, of the Japanese strategy. And in fact, uh, Chris, if you don't mind me just delving back a little bit. <laughs> Japanese strategy probably failed the first five seconds of the attack on Pearl Harbor when Americans suddenly realized what had happened and swore that they were willing to do anything it took to roll back the Japanese from their gains. And so, so in that sense, Guadalcanal is kind of the first harvest, the first fruits of that, uh, of that strategic reality. So that's the, I, I could stop now Chrissy would be pretty angry with me. And, and we were still, we were still, Well, yeah, 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 yeah I'd say, we, it's 12.15, I think you got a little more time here. <laughs> and we would stop now, and brought, brought up now support in the Pacific War. It's a signal moment in the Pacific War. But, but what I'd like to do for the rest of our time together is broaden this out a bit. 
uh, uh, draw back that lens. What happened on Guadalcanal is fascinating, and, and again, you've heard it from Rick, uh, from Rich, excuse me, and from Jim, and they've, they've told the GLA champions. But when it happened has always struck me as even uh, more significant. And so to talk about when, let's, let's draw back a little. Let's do a brief global tour of World War II in the fall of 1942. So I think we could probably start. Oh, so there, look at the Pacific Theater. You see the, the Solomon Islands in the deep south of that map, Guadalcanal, located above to the northeast of Australia. You see Midway, northwest of Pearl Harbor, off to the northeastern uh, quadrant of that map. And, and these, are the, these are the signal moments that wrest away uh, initiative from the Japanese in the Pacific War. But let's, again, take a tour of World War II and, and, and look a bit at some other sites of battle in the fall of 1942. Here's one of the great figures in, in the history of the Second World War, and undoubtedly most of you, if not all of you, have, have seen this image many, many times. Let's head first to North Africa, the site of one of the most exciting and, for lack of a better term, nail-biting campaigns mm -hmm. in the entire war. Here, forces under Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, uh, and there he is, the famous uh, Desert Fox, uh, wearing his, uh, we often call them his designer goggles. <laughs> Not really designer goggles, they were taken off of a, a, a dead English airman, by, by all accounts, at least that's what most of the accounts said, and he, he realized how useful they were. So he's not really wearing them as a style a statement, but to keep the sand out of his eyes. You may know he suffered from chronic sinusitis, and anything that prevents it, you know, dry, dryness of eyes or, or nose was good for Rommel, and so these actually play a therapeutic function. But there he is. Um, Rommel and his Panzer Army Africa, the Axis forces under his command, Tank Army Africa would be the best translation from the German. We're smashing their way forward across North Africa in summer of 1942 against the British Eighth Army. So there's a look, a look at the kind of theater of the Desert War from 1940 to 1942. Uh, it's essentially the big bulge of Cyrenaica in what is today Libya. Notice the Libyan-Egyptian uh, border. Mountains of barbed wire. Uh, e Egypt is a British protectorate at the time. Libya was an Italian or Axis colony. Notice the, the, the vast distances involved across that bulge by the cord from El Algela to Sidi Barani, about 600 miles. So I'll let you do the math to think about how much that might have been to actually drive the coastal road along the bulge. Now, every bullet, every drop of water, every gallon of lubricant or fuel had to be brought in from outside. It is the desert. <laughs> there, there are inhabitants there, and a great deal of them, largely Bedouin, at least in the deep desert, uh, Tobruk, Benghazi, uh, El Algela to a certain extent, have a larger urban population, but a hell to fight in, and especially by the uh, by virtue of the elements, which is hot, hot, hot. So in the summer of 1942, Rommel was on the offensive again. Um, uh, he had fought his way up to Gazala line in May of 1942, and then from there heading east, crossing the border, uh, crossing the wire, as we often say, into Egypt, and heading towards the Suez Canal, heading towards Alexandria, the Nile Delta, and the Suez Canal. Um, He'd been fighting the British Eighth Army, so the Rommel's Panzer Army Africa on the one side and the British Eighth Army on the next. While Rommel commanded the uh, Panzer Army Africa, it, it's interesting to note that the British were under a variety of different commanders. Uh, General Ritchie, General Auchinleck, and finally General Bernard Law Montgomery. And of course the reason for that is they kept getting beat. <laughs> um, that, that you, you keep the victorious commander, Rommel, that stayed in power the whole, in command the whole time. And, and Churchill desperately seeking some combination of command and staff and force that would slow Rommel down. So, so what's at stake here? Um, you know, Berlin's a thousand miles to the north. It couldn't be further away. What are we? Uh, why are the British and Germans fighting their way across North Africa? Well, there's something huge at stake, and that something huge is the Suez Canal, just off the map to our east, the lifeline of the British Empire. In my humble opinion, and for what it's worth, you know, I've studied the German sources, so I, I know what the Germans thought about this. This might have been the best chance Germany had to win the war. At, at least, uh, Chrissy, to win the war against the British, which you, know, right. you have to win a war against somebody when it's a coalition. You've got to knock <laughs> one of the partners out. And this was probably their best chance to do some, put a serious hit on the British and the British Empire. Now, as Rommel and his uh, forces drove forward, 
they came up against, oh, there's General Bernard Law Montgomery, Monty, in his jaunty beret. Something about him just drives American commanders crazy in the course of the war, and I'm not, we can talk, any questions on that, we can answer them later. As they drove forward, the uh, German forces, they came up against a, a, a deep, a tight bottleneck between the sea, the Mediterranean Sea to the north, and the so-called Katara Depression to the south, a impassable sand desert. Quicksand is kind of a, um, a cinematic formulation. It's almost a myth, a plot device that allows the bad guy to get stuck or the good guy to get stuck and be rescued. But this is the real deal. It's shifting sand and it's impassable for heavy, uh, in, uh, for heavy mechanized forces. So the British were finally in a kind of a bottleneck, maybe about 30 miles from north to south. And here they were able to make a stand finally against Rommel and, uh, and his Axis forces. Now they did that, let's be honest, with a great deal of aid from the United States, a great deal of lend-lease assistance, including tanks and aircraft of all sorts. Tanks that were being produced for, for the army America was building, and it was thus extremely important, would be shipped to the Middle East and handed over to the British, often very much to the anger and angst of American commanders who felt that American needs should come first. Roosevelt felt that someone was already in contact with the Germans fighting them, wearing down German forces, and that someone was Montgomery in, in, uh, in North Africa. And so with a great deal of Lend-Lease assistance and support, the British held fast against Rommel's drives in July and August. And then in late October, and that's the meaning of the map you're looking at right now, in late October, launched a powerful counteroffensive of their own. Sometimes the third battle of El Alamein, Rommel had made a couple attempts to break through in, in, in July and, and August. And then this big counteroffensive of the, of the British Operation Lightfoot in late October. <sighs> Montgomery broke through uh, Rommel's lines and forced the Germans and Italians, the Axis forces, into a headlong retreat in November. In other words, this is all occurring just about the time the United States was winning the Battle of Guadalcanal. So it's happening almost. So if you're picking up your newspaper in late October, victory in Guadalcanal, um, uh, M Montgomery breaking through Rommel's forces. You're reading those stories probably on opposite ends of the front page somewhere. Rommel was forced into headlong retreat again in November. The threat to Suez was halted once and for all. Now, I don't know this for a fact, because I don't really have these records, but this might have been the first time in World War II that Churchill might have gotten a good mess with <laughs> because, because we we Americans, I don't think we really key into the Suez Canal, although we should. It's a crucial waterway for world commerce today. The Suez Canal is crucial to, to everyone, but we don't key into it as, as one of the, the, the real objectives of World War II in quite the way that the British did. When you dug the Suez Canal, you cut the distance from London to Bombay in half, probably more than in half. And so it was not like, well, we'll take the Suez route because we, we want the faster route today, or we'll, we'll still go around the Cape of Good Hope because we like the scenic route. You don't do that. The, the, the shorter route becomes the strategic waterway and bottleneck. And so the loss of the Suez Canal, would it have defeated the Allies? Oh, that's tough to say, particularly since we're already had the Manhattan Project is already underway, and it's, it's tough to say. Would it have meant big, big strategic problems for the British and, and for the entire Allied cause? And the, the question there is undeniably, absolutely. So just as the tide is turning on Guadalcanal, the tide is turning in North Africa, and the threat to the Suez Canal is finally tamed, brought to an end, in fact, once and for all. So. Christy, we could stop here, but you'd still be angry because I'm not telling the whole story yet. So yeah. <laughs> let's continue. There's so much going on in this period. Uh, and let me just uh, go to the next map for the moment to introduce it. At the very same moment that Rommel is making his last great lunch for the Suez Canal, that's summer of 1942, mm -hmm. the Germans are launching another great offensive on the Eastern Front. And it, it, in many ways, it would prove be their last great offensive. They do launch one in 43, but it's abortive. It barely gets underway before it's crushed by the uh, uh, Soviets, and we can talk about that in a bit. So the last great offensive on the Eastern Front, and it goes by the name of Operation Blue, Unternehmen Blau, if you like to know the German. Uh, it aimed for the key industrial city of, of Stalingrad, which you can see there, and from there, a sharp right turn to the south, a drive into the great oil fields of the Caucasus mountain region. In particular, three cities, Maikop to the uh, Northwest Caucasus, uh, Grozny, 
on the near the shores of the Caspian Sea, and then almost off the map on the southeast, Baku. Uh, Baku is the furthest and the greatest of the oil fields. In fact, I think at the time it's the fourth largest oil field in the world. And today, it might still occupy the top top five. It, 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 it's close. If, if it is top five, it's fifth. But the great oil fields. <sighs> German planners, including Hitler, who has a reputation for never looking at reality, but that reputation is kind of false, uh, knew that the war could not go on unless uh, Germany was able to secure large supplies of oil and other resources. And that's the whole point of the Caucasus. It's virtually a forgotten campaign in World War II, and it shouldn't be. Uh, we talk about oil wars, wars for oil all the time, and here is the first of the great oil wars, the lunge into the Caucasus. So, uh, you have twin offensives in a sense. Can I do a little bit of paging back and yeah. forth? I'm not going to give anyone whiplash or vertigo. So. I don't okay. think so. Let's, yeah. Just hope that the tech just, cooperates, but I think we're good. Okay, good, good. So there's really twin offensives going on in the summer of 1942, and there's a drive towards Stalingrad, and that's what this one is showing. And then also a lunge, a deep lunge into the Caucasus mountain region for the oil, happening at the same time. Soviet forces spent the mo most of the summer of 1942 reeling back in some confusion. A uh, headlong palmetto retreat, whatever adjective you want to use. Um, been a lot of, there's a lot of controversy about it. Was it ordered by Stalin as a way of sort of giving up space for time, rapid retreat, get out of the Germans' way, let them expend their limited supplies of kinetic energy and, and, and oil coming forward and then eventually deal them a counter blow? Or was it just an army ne ne nearly falling apart? Uh, m maybe it was both. Maybe Stalin ordered a retreat and was carried out in a rather hectic and inept fashion. But the Soviets spent the summer and much of the early fall, um, in, in fact, uh, still reeling back from this German offensive, surrendering hundreds of miles of extremely valuable real estate to the Germans. And, you know, the Germans had invaded the Soviet Union in 41, and, and, and they had their way with the Red Army. They inflicted 4 million casualties, 3 million prisoners, 3 million prisoners in, in those early battles. And the Soviets had managed to right themselves at the last second in front of Moscow and deal the Germans a counter blow. And, and, and so they had survived. And, and now it seems to be happening again. And, and, German forces are heading east and south into some of the richest and most productive territories of the Soviet Union. By the end of August, uh, the Germans stood at the gates, if you want to put it that way, of both objectives. That is, the gates of Stalingrad, they'd broken into the southern portion of the city. Stalingrad sits like a long rectangle, a kind of letter I, a little bit slanted, along the Volga Riverbank, that is to the, I want to get this straight, to the right bank, that is, the Volga is flowing north to south. Uh, and then so we're on the right bank of the Volga here. So they stood on the outskirts of Stalingrad and were breaking into the city and, and had also lunged deep into the Caucasus. They, they'd taken the oil city of Mykol. Uh, Soviets had demolished the place and set the oil wells on fire, uh, pouring concrete into the wellheads and the million and one other things you apparently do to render an oil field unusable. We can we live here in Louisiana, we can talk to the engineers, and I'm sure they could tell us, uh, Chrissy, there's a lot of it. But nevertheless, the Germans, as you can see from the blue arrows, had, had lunged hundreds of miles deep into the Caucasus. We're coming up against the, the main Caucasus range itself, like the Rocky Mountains, so, so a big obstacle. But nevertheless, oil fields are beckoning. Now, once again, uh, as in North Africa, the Germans were unable to seal the deal. They, they were unable to sustain their momentum. And you have to say this, a campaign being fought for oil is probably going to run out of gasoline before you get to the oil. I mean, that, that's that's why the Germans weren't able to conquer the Caucasus. They didn't have the oil, and that's why they were attempting it. So it's, uh, I, I don't know, we're kind of in a temporal, a, cause, a causational loop here, I guess, when one thing keeps leading to the other, but there's never any resolution. So their momentum was probably bound to flag German momentum at some point, the further they moved away from their supply bases. Um, if you're a tank regiment and you have uh, 150 tanks, let's say 75 tanks in your tank regiment, probably by this time to the Germans, and that, that that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of fuel. You know about more miles per gallon. Tanks are the opposite. Tanks are gallons per mile, and and so every mile forward, they have to, you know it's, it gets more and more difficult to resupply them because how do you resupply them? You send trucks forward with fuel. How do the trucks run? They run on fuel. And so the further you get away from your supply bases, it gets more and more difficult to supply. And Soviet, the Soviets fought hard. They, they eventually reformed their lines. But really, German momentum, I would say, was bound to flag at some point. By late October, 
just about the time the United States was winning the Battle of Guadalcanal. Have I said that? No, you, yeah. <laughs> okay, I, will, I, yeah. I will say it again. Um, the Soviets managed to halt the Germans and, and, and did so in style, especially in this first leg, especially in Stalingrad. Here, the, the greatest urban battle of all time was fought between German 6th Army and the Soviet 62nd Army, in which the Soviets turned every building in Guadalcanal into a miniature fortress. The Dzerzhinsky Tractor Works, the Red Barricades Factory, a huge battle spot for the vodka factory in, in the northern factory districts, the northern industrial districts of, of Stalingrad. If you think about heavy industrial building, these are these are solid buildings made of reinforced concrete, heavy, heavy walls that often have to be, be to take the pounding of the various kinds of industrial equipment. And here the, the Germans were finally uh, uh, brought to a halt, both by their own flaggy momentum, but also by the Soviet army fighting in some of the best defensive terrain in the world. So just about the time the United States was winning the Battle of Guadalcanal, the Soviets halted the Germans in the Caucasus and in Stalingrad. That's October. In November, they launch a vast counteroffensive, a counterstroke of their own, encircling and destroying an entire German army inside Stalingrad. This is Operation Uranus, as it was known. All the Soviet operations of 1942 were named after planets. There's Operation Saturn, there's Operation Mars, there's Operation Uranus. Chrissy just said, I didn't know that. And that's yeah. why I'm here, Chrissy. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Um, so this is Operation Uranus. Uh, notice attacks, there's Stalingrad, up, attack to the north and then to the south of Stalingrad, link up behind the city and trap a German army of 200,000 men, which eventually ran out of supplies and food and, and marched uh, completely into Soviet captivity in early 1943. Oh, uh, by the way, just to seal up the story, count, general counteroffensive of Soviet armies in the Caucasus also drive the, the Germans out of the Caucasus, away from the oil fields as well. Finally, to seal off this incredible run of Allied victories, it was all happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. In November of 1942, Anglo-American forces landed in Morocco and Algeria in North Africa. This is the famous Operation Torch. Closing in on Rommel from the west. So Rommel was in retreat from his encounter with Montgomery, and now he's got Anglo-American forces closing in on him from the west. U.S. forces weren't yet in Europe. Those of you who are paying attention will know this is North Africa, so it's not yet in Europe. But American forces had crossed the Atlantic and were now in the general theater of war against the Axis. So that's November of 1942. If I can sum this up then, Guadalcanal by itself is meaningful. <laughs> There's no doubt about that, definitely. Bad news for Japan. As I've already stated, I believe it undercut the entire strategy on which the, Jap which the Japanese had formulated to, to run this defensive struggle. So it's important. But Guadalcanal plus El Alamein plus Stalingrad plus the Caucasus plus Operation Torch, all either happening or coming to a climax in virtually the same week, that's crazy. If I wrote that, yeah. if I wrote that, my, my uh, you know, my editor would say, Rob, that's just improbable. But of course, not, you know, not writing it, it has the added advantage, you know, of, of actually being true. You couldn't write a more improbable set of events if you tried. These big five wins meant that Axis chances of winning World War II, which were never big to begin with, in my opinion, had now probably reached somewhere around zero. I'm not really big on turning points in war. War isn't a football game. It's not like you're winning and then you throw a pick six and then you're losing and then your fans are happy and then they're sad. It, it's usually more subtle than that. Strategic changes it, it always come kind of gradually and slowly. But nevertheless, if you need to identify a moment in World War II that can reasonably be called the turning point, then November of 1942 is it. The Axis was now in retreat all across the globe and had lost the initiative a better healed and more prosperous and, and better supplied allied force was now going to be harrying them from point A to B all the way to the Z point, which is going to end in Tokyo and Berlin. So those are the comments I have for you all in this webinar today. I have, I have Chrissy at my side and, and yeah. I think we're, we've got some questions. We, to throw at me. Definitely open, open it up to questions. So I guess uh, the first one, I feel like I've kind of gotten a couple people wondering, so what is, what's the next step now for Japan? What, you've set this up yep. in this whole 
I mean, we can talk about Germany too, but let's first talk about Japan. We've said this up, you know, these five strategic victories. Yes. You know, do they realize this? And now what? You know? Internal debate within the Japanese high command realizes it. Now, that's not to say decisions were made based on that internal debate. Um, I think in some sense, the Japanese high command in World War II, and I'm going all the way up to the Emperor Hirohito, who somehow gets a pass on all this, but in my opinion, doesn't deserve a pass on all this. I think they were all guilty of a certain amount of groupthink. The groupthink was that, that American, the American people, as the representatives of a, of a, a of a democracy, but also a commercial state, more interested in buying and selling things in the British style, were not a martial race like the Japanese were. And since the American people were not a martial race, they wouldn't be able to stand up to the kind of combat it would take to win battles in the South Pacific. Now, that had been proven wrong at Guadalcanal. But there's always another island up the road. If we May I go back to my uh, the, the sort of quick yeah, and dirty map that. of the um, I think it's right coming up. One and a couple more, and wait, well, they're sorry about that, right? <laughs> so this is the Pacific Theater in, from 1941 to 1945. Now, um, the Japanese had had it all their own way. Briefly, they had launched war against America in 1941 in order to, if not destroy, at least to remove the U.S. fleet from operations in the Western Pacific. Once that had been done, they could conquer a vast resource empire in the south, uh, in Southeast Asia. That is Indochina, the Dutch East Indies, the Philippines, oil, rubber, tin, and a lot of other strategic raw materials that Japan needed so that it could bring an end to the war in China. It's a very, that to me is, I would say, a convoluted strategy. It's a complex strategy. Uh, it, it, it perhaps is overly complex. A great German philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, once said, in war, everything is very simple, but even the simplest thing is difficult. So, so right, right, I mean, you, you know, we're here and they're there and we want to go there. That's essentially, you want to conquer somebody's territory in war. Saying it is easy. <clears throat> Putting together the, 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 the plans and the administration and the logistics for it. You know, you, you all had this experience. Try to get uh, 10 of your friends to go to the same movie. How many phone calls it takes? Three of them don't show up, two of them are late, and the movie gets canceled. So all sorts of things happen. So the Japanese were still wedded to that strategy. And and I know for a fact there are there are members of the Japanese high command who say, well, we lost Guadalupe now. But we won't lose, I'm looking at the map, we won't lose the Caroline Islands. We won't lose, uh, we won't lose Tarawa. Uh, we won't lose, you know, and eventually it goes all the way up. We won't lose Saipan. We won't lose Iwo Jima. We'll fight for Okinawa. We'll... The, the Japanese were, uh, you know, fancied themselves as being a martial race, which, by the way, I don't believe anyone, any human set of human beings is any more martial than anyone else, given the correct circumstances. They fancied themselves as the ultimate martial race, and they were determined to take this one down to the wire. And so what's next for Japan, Chris, is how the question was phrased. And I hate to say this, given how it would all play out, what's next for Japan? More of the same. Right. They'll lose one island grouping after the other, a gigantic air base and, and a logistical base at Rabaul, which, they won't, which they'll simply abandon. Actually, we will bypass it, and they will use, lose 70 or 80,000 men still sitting in Rabaul, who will eventually go into U.S. custody. This is the problem of losing the initiative. It's a big island, a big ocean, excuse me. It's a big ocean. And now it's the Americans who can choose when and where to attack. And, and I think American commanders, MacArthur in, in the South uh, West Pacific and the Nimitz across the Central Pacific, I think they did a very good job in keeping the Japanese off balance for the rest of the war. So that is my answer, more of the same. Hmm. All right, um, so before we get to our next actual question, um, there's a couple of folks who wanted a better shot oh. of, your, of uh, your dad's artifacts. And I'll tell you folks, while, while uh, Dr. Steen is holding them up, I know people want a, a bigger view of it. So let me show you how to do that on your side technically. You should see the webcam, you know, um, and Dr. Stino there on top. You should see a bar that separates the slides from the, um, from the webcam. And if you click on that gray bar, you can slide it down and actually get a bigger view of yeah, the artifacts. Can they do a screen capture too? If that's yeah, a so right. you can also do a screen cap and it'll be in the recording. And then if you don't mind, I'm getting real close here, but I'm going to zoom in real quick. So I'm not sure see. anyone's ready for that. <laughs> An it's, HD, it's, right? Oh my. <laughs> yeah, so you can see, uh, I don't know if you, uh, <laughs> you can see oh, it's right. uh, zoomed in, whether see, you right, like yeah. it or not. <laughs> so there's a couple of them, all right? Yeah. And uh, one other. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, you can see it. 
Many yeah. times, as a, yes. as a joke, my mother or father so. would brandish one of these at us and mm -hmm. never actually make contact. But, <laughs> but there's the Native War Club from Wild Now. Awesome, and yeah, we'll and we'll capture that, of course, on the um, on the recording. Happy, yeah, happy to oblige. Thank yes. you, whoever asked that. Yeah, that, uh, that was Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. All right, so back to back to some questions. Sure. Um, so we have one from Stephen coming in saying, uh, since the British could not use the Mediterranean due to German and Italian air power, why was the Suez so important? Weren't the British having to sail around the Cape of Good Hope anyway? They were sailing around the Cape of Good Hope anyway, but a German or Axis force in command of the Suez Canal might have opened other waters in the in the world to German warships, but predominantly to German uh, to German submarines as well. So temporarily out of it's temporarily out of uh, out of play. But the Suez Canal was, is, and always would be as long as there was a British Empire, the lifeline of the British Empire, and the fastest route to India. You know, it's it's funny fighting over the Suez. There's so many ironies of World War II. Fighting over the Suez Canal because of the route to India. Britain will abandon India in 1947 and 1948, leading to immense chaos inside the subcontinent, a war between the new states of Pakistan and, and India, and, and maybe the loss of a million lives. Uh, and that's just a few years later, after you know, after an entire military campaign had been based around the Suez Canal. Here's another irony for you. Oh, by the way, was that Stephen? Uh, that was Stephen who was asking. Good, good question, Stephen. Here's another irony for you, Stephen, and for everyone else. Uh, one of Rommel's biggest problems in, in campaigning in North Africa was lack of fuel. Uh, again, there's an endemic mm -hmm. problem for the Germans. He's, he's, he's campaigning in Libya, he's standing on top of some of the world's largest oil reserves that had not yet been found. <laughs> so if someone had just, I don't know, stuck a stick into the ground, a huge geyser comes up, like Beverly Hillbilly style. The next thing you know, Rommel is winning World War II. It's one of the great ironies of the war, no oil will be standing right on top of it. Crazy. Um, sorry to follow up. Sure. Anthony was saying he has the same type of war clothes. Get out, man. That's great. Did, yeah. did Anthony was your dad on Guadalcanal? Yeah, he said his dad was in the. Uh, let me go back to a. He said his dad was um, in artillery. Yeah. So, Fantastic. So um, yeah, you said they weren't. That you you heard that they're relatively common, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously not common to. Right. Know, Personal artifact. Maybe a lot of soldiers. Again, so. people told me that a lot of soldiers did pick them up, Anthony. If you want to go to the museum's website, or maybe Chrissy has some way of getting it to him, and yeah, get my I'll, email I'll address. Out. Yeah, be happy to have some more talk with Anthony. Absolutely. Yeah, Anthony, um, I've got your email, and I'll I'll connect you guys. Great. That's the beauty of technology. It's right? the beauty, it's the beauty <laughs> of technology. Yeah. So, all right, and then let me get to. Uh, let's see here. We had another question. I just need to find. Oh, from Hank. Hey. Um, Hank wants to know how did the Navy get resources to um, fight in the fall of 1942 when Europe, UK, Russia were getting most of them? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I wouldn't say Europe and, and UK and Russia were getting most of them. Certainly, in in, in certain items. Tanks and aircraft. I think the Amer American forces were probably relatively light because of because of Len Lease. And remember, this campaign, the Soviet Union, is coming to a climax. A million man armies are are clinching. When you're talking about the, the fight for Guadalcanal or the fight for the Solomon Islands, you, it's Operation Watchtower, but you may know this. Marine commanders said, "We'll fight. We'll, we'll fight this campaign, even if we have to do it on a shoestring." And the Marines that kind of called it Operation Shoestring. It's a relatively small campaign that was still within the boundaries of an extremely wealthy and productive America to supply. Now, having said that, I, I don't want happy talk about this. The Marines because it's easy to do happy talk. Oh, it's all going to work out in the end. The Marines went into Guadalcanal under-resourced. I don't think there's any doubt about that. In fact, it's kind of the Marine credo. The Marines pride themselves on doing more with less, but, but sometimes they like a little more. You know what I mean? But let's, let's keep that less within bounds. And so I, I think when you look at it, it was still a campaign that was within American logistical and supply uh, range uh, from largely from Australia. It's not really sailing across the open ocean, but largely being supply, supplied from Australia. And so it's within bounds. But uh, this, there's a myth, you know, Christy, about World War II that America won World War II strictly because it outproduced. I mean, it's right. important. Sit, we yeah. we, we celebrate it here, you know, the arsenal of democracy. Yeah. It's important, but there are many, many moments in World War II when U.S. forces found themselves on the short side mm -hmm. or fighting from a position of scarcity as opposed to a position of plenty. And if you really think that, well, we just outproduced our enemies, we just outsupplied our troops, you know, as they say, tell it to the Marines. Yeah. <laughs> because I think the Marines, might, the Marines like Guadalcanal in particular, give you a little different story about that. All right, so uh, we've got another question from, this may be more like a pop culture, so, or, or your recommendations at least, kind of question from Joseph Vargo. He said he's read Guadalcanal Diary and Good. Helmet for My Pillow. Do you have any other personal accounts or recommendations of 
how to expand yeah. their uh, yeah. Sam, yeah. Samuel Griffiths. I think it's called Samuel Griffiths. I think it's called the 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 Battle for Guadalcanal. Okay. Uh, it's about the it, it's it's to me the best short single volume introduction to the fight for Guadalcanal. And, and it's written soon after the events in the early 1950s. I'd have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, see if it's still on uh, Amazon. But if not, <laughs> yeah. you know, if, if not, so. um, I don't like to do a commercial for anybody. But since you mentioned Amazon, there's always aid books, which sells used books as well. So you there can you probably go. get yourself a copy of the Battle for <laughs> Guadalcanal. It's it's just top notch. Now, it's it's relatively short, you know, which has its advantages. It's a pocket paperback. If you want the full meal deal. The complete, the whole enchilada. Then, of course, you have to read Rich Frank's book on the on the Battle of Guadalcanal. It's it's obsessively detailed, and I say that in, as, as a compliment. Rich, Rich Rich is obsessive about everything he does in terms of the detail, in terms of the research he pours into every paragraph. And you're not going to learn more about Guadalcanal from any book than you will learn from uh, from Frank's book. You know, you mentioned uh, Guadalcanal Diary, and, and let me veer off Guadalcanal for a moment. Let's get off the island. Richard Tregaskis also wrote another book called Invasion Diary, which if you haven't read it, uh, is this Hank? Uh, let's see, uh, this is jo uh, Joseph. It's Joseph. Yeah. Joseph, if you haven't read uh, Invasion Diary, I really urge you to do that. Uh, it's about Richard Tregaskis' experiences in North Africa and Italy. And uh, while that, you know, that may, may or may not be as exciting to folks as Wilder Canal, it, it has a really shocking moment in the middle when Tregaskis suffers a serious head wound from a piece of shrapnel right through his helmet. And a lot of that book is about his his struggle, which many soldiers would have to recover, to recover his equilibrium as a as a human being, to learn kind of how to talk all over again, and then how to walk all over again. And it's a so Guadalcanal Diary is a is a masterpiece. Invasion Diary has never won the same audience, mm -hmm. but I think given the kind of harrowing uh, material inside, I'm not surprised by that. Yeah. Um, all right. So next one from David. He is wondering. He says, uh, with Guadalcanal being so far south. What was the role of the Australian Army or Navy? Yeah, let's, uh, let's I think, previous, right? I'm just trying to hit the right okay. buttons here. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to hit the right buttons now. Australian forces, uh, in particular naval and light craft, played a role in helping resupply uh, uh, U.S. forces on Guadalcanal. Uh, Australia's land forces were, were carrying the fight to the enemy on, on New Guinea and had been for some time. I was fortunate enough to teach a couple of years at the U.S. Army War College from 13, 2013 to 2015. Uh, about a quarter of your students in those classes are foreign officers. We call them international fellows. They're, they're friendlies. They're folks <laughs> in friendly nations. I don't just let anybody in. But, but one of my, my finest students there is Brigadier General now in the Australian Army named Ben James. And Ben, give, ben, ben would quote a chapter and verse on the Australians in, in the fight for New Guinea, the defense first of Port Moresby, the principal port in New Guinea, the, drive across, the, the halting of the Japanese drive across the Kokoda Trail, the crossing of the Owen Stanley Mountains. So it's not so much their participation in the Battle of Guadalcanal as, as Australia serving as our principal supply and logistics base, and then some, some timely assistance rendered. It's funny. Within Australia, World War I is seen as heroic. Gallipoli, for example, Anzac forces, which fought so artfully and, and were, uh, bravely in World War I. World War II had a hard time making traction. It looked like the, the Australians had cowered and waited for the Americans to come and rescue them. And, and, and now, thankfully, that's been exploded as the myth that is and always has been. And I think you get a lot more uh, Australian public interest in what happened in World War II as well. And, I mean, no, Aust no Australia, very difficult to fight this campaign in the first place, let alone win it. I mean, I think it's impossible to fight if you don't have a friendly continent from which to base your forces. And as you can see on the map, that friendly continent is Australia. Close. Yeah. Um, all right. So one from Jim. Uh, he was, he's saying that he's been watching a DVD about Guadalcanal. He said he hasn't finished it yet. But, <laughs> I won't um, tell you the end. <laughs> yeah, this is a spoiler alert, right? Spoiler alert. Um, he said the story seems to indicate that all the battles took place around Henderson Field. Was the rest of the island ignored? No, I, I wouldn't say so. If we can just yeah, if we can, go, yeah, go back. Go your first slide. Yeah, I think it's the first yeah. slide. It might have been a quicker way to get there. Oh, how do I get back to my first slide? Let's see, if we, just, uh, if we just do the, sorry, folks, no, it's going to scroll. Thank probably the easiest. There this we go. This is why I need yeah. Chrissy desperately. So there's, <laughs> Bottle Canal is not actually canted this way. It's canted a little more to the, to the northeast. Um, and there you see the airfield. Uh, Lunga Point, and just south of the of Lunga Point is the airfield. And then be, beneath the airfield, south of the airfield, is, is, is a ridge, which became famous as Bloody Ridge or Edson's Ridge in the, in the course of the fighting. So 
all I don't want to make a blanket statement, but I think it's true enough to make it as a blanket statement. All battles in, of these small islands in the South Pacific were essentially for one reason. You're not conquering Guadalcanal doesn't really give you any advantage. You have to find the one spot on the island that was useful for an air base, a flat enough position where the the, the, the second or third growth jungle had been cleared away or had not grown in the first place, and a, a relatively flat space where you could build an airfield. And the Japanese, as you may know, uh, had already started their airfield, partially completed airfield, when the 1st Marine Division landed there, seized the airfield. Uh, so in a sense, there are fights all around the airfield. Uh, Coley Point, Point Cruz, the, the Matanaka River, uh, the Lunga River, Lunga Point on both sides, and of course Edson's Ridge just south of the airfield. The, the rest of the island was essentially a, a strategic, I would strategically useless sounds overstated. <laughs> the rest of the island was strategically unimportant. It, it was where, it's very difficult to build them and airfield anywhere on Guadalcanal, as a matter of fact. Right, yeah. Japanese picked one spot and we had now taken it from them. So, Again, we're kidding about your spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. um, Japanese forces will eventually be chased all the way into the interior and to Cape Esperance. And that's the campaign my father fought in and, and will, under fire, you know, and, and uh, partially at night, be able to evacuate most of their forces from the island. Uh, but that's, you know, that's early 1943 and the sort of money phase of the Guadalcanal campaign. It does boil down essentially to a fight for Henderson Field. And that's really true of all the, of all the island battles. Why are you conquering the island? To build an airfield. The island as a naval base, for example, and, and ships do put into a, a, at least the coastal regions of Guadalcanal, shelter them. The island as a naval base has, has a range of, of, of whatever your naval ships, you know, however fast they can go in three days uh, before they have to refuel. But, but, but given an airfield there, you can reach out and touch forces on neighboring islands in the, you know, in, in the course of an hour or in the course of a half hour. It, it, the air power multiplies as a force multiplier for your strength. And so it's these island bases slash airfields which are really at play in the Pacific campaign, and I would say especially on Guadalcanal. So there's, uh, if I could just finish this off, there's no, there, it's not random. The landing site of the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal is not random. Had the, the, the landing had to take place as close as possible to the one uh, a place where a functioning airfield was being built on Guadalcanal. All right, and then I think we have, let's see here, we're at 12.52 Central Time. I think we may have time for a couple sure. more questions. Are you good? Oh, absolutely, man. I love right. it. I love it. So, I do it all day. Go all day. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, I have a question from T, and they're actually wondering, um, they had a couple uncles fighting on Guadalcanal, and they're asking, how, how do I find out more information about them? Can you kind of steer them in the right direction yeah, a little bit? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's one so. way of, of always finding any, any kind of personnel records about any U.S. serviceman or woman in World War II, and that's to go to the National Archives Branch Veterans Affairs Division in St. Louis, Missouri. That's where the personnel records are kept. Now, there's a process for doing that, and, and we at the museum put together a handy, dandy little guide. Yeah, I think it's on the website. Guide. Did so, I think that's been placed on the website, or is it about to be placed on okay, the website? Okay, so if it, if it is, I will I will send that in the follow-up email to folks. If, if you would. So, so, so. so the reason we put together a handy, dandy little guide is actually 30 pages. It's, <laughs> it's government work. You're dealing with the federal bureaucracy. It's extremely complex. You want to make sure you're filling out your paperwork correctly. Mm -hmm. You have to. You have to be, my understanding is, and again, feel, feel, feel free to confirm this in the guide when you get it or see it, you have to be a direct relative that is like the heir. Mm. I mean, you can't say my uncle fought. If, if your aunt is still alive, you cannot request your uncle's personnel records. Mm. Your aunt can. She's his heir. Yeah. Uh, if there is no surviving heir, I, I'm sure there's a, there's a grid that will take us down these various paths and say who can ask for what. But you have to be, you know, the direct lineal descendant and heir of the person in order to do that. These are confidential. They often have very confidential things about uh, your loved ones. I don't know, your, an injury your loved one might not have ever told anyone about for whatever reason or counseling he received or disciplinary actions. You know, the, the, the old joke is never ask a question that you're not sure you want the complete answer right. to, and certainly not suggesting this is an issue here. But the point is, it's, it's, it can often be confidential, and that's why it's very limited as to who to ask, who can ask. Mm -hmm. We're the National, two, National World War II Museum. We just can't call up St. Louis and say, hey, tell right. us about Joe Smith. We'll and get, we get a lot of requests like that, but we yeah, just can't, just yeah, can't just, unfortunately just can't, can't feel, feel just that. Just can't do it. So, mm -hmm. so that's, I mean, that, that's my answer to your question. Now, there's one other complicating factor in the 1970s. National Archive Branch in St. Louis experienced a huge fire. 
and large numbers of records were destroyed. And those that weren't destroyed by the fire were destroyed by the water after the, after the firemen arrived or the, the sprinkler system turned out. I give them credit. They are going through painstaking, a painstaking process of trying to restore as many uh, of these records as they can. They're, they're saying, their meme, if you will, since we all talk internet now, <laughs> is that 80% of those records were destroyed. Wow. Whether it will be 80% when all the restoration work is done is open to question. But the point is that's a complicating factor as well. You could say, I've done everything right, I filled out the paperwork, I found the correct archive, and then you could still wind up in, in a dead end. 16 million men and women donned the uniform of the United States in the course of World War II. And if in fact 80% of that stuff is lost, that's a, that's a national tragedy. I, I live in archives as a historian. Without archives, where are we? As historians, where are we in terms of our public memory? And uh, that was a that was a bad break. I I've never investigated the fire, how it happened, why it happened. I'm just saying it's a bad break. All right, and then maybe let's see. Okay, twelve fifty five. I think we can fit in one more. Sure. Cool. Okay. So uh, Jacob uh, is wondering. Uh, so back to kind of more of a specific Waddle Canal question. Sure. How much do the losses of Japanese air power at the Battle of Midway impact the outcome of Guadalcanal? Canal? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the most of the air, well, the, the loss of Japanese air power at Midway impacted the entire Japanese military posture. I mean, there's no doubt about it. You get four aircraft carriers, all their aircraft, most of their personnel going down really in the course of a two-day battle. Japanese only had you know six fleet carriers to begin with, and lost four, roughly a 24-hour period. So, I mean, it impacted Japanese forces across the board. Most of the air power that is flying to Guadalcanal, most Japanese air power flying to Guadalcanal is taking off from Rabaul and, and, and points north. That is its land-based air power as opposed to naval-based air power. So, I mean, on the one hand, I would say, well, probably it's not a deal breaker, the fact that those carriers aren't there because most of the Japanese effort is land-based. But you can't lose four aircraft carriers and have all the options that aircraft carriers allow you to pursue closed off and not say that it didn't play a material role in the lo Japanese loss of Guadalcanal. And actually, you know, hey, with that, I think we're at 12.57, and I want to just give a couple more well, announcements. Let me see. Let me actually pull up a uh, different slideshow. Just not, no, no more HD close-ups. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, I did, I I did just put you up here again, so sorry about that. Solo. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to give everybody, of course, a few quick reminders here. Uh, number one is that, you know, we... Um, Today, you know, we've covered a lot of material. In the last three months, we've covered a lot of material, and all of these things are being recorded, which is awesome. And so you will have access to all of these recordings here. Um, and uh, let me actually get to those recordings. Oh, we went back to Rob's slide. Give me a second, folks. I'm, have, I'm having a little tech, tech difficulties here. You should see, there's a picture of the museum. Let me show you my, my stuff. All right, let's see. I want to show you all. Tech I know. You know. Board <laughs> so just, just to, as I said, review with everybody one more time. I will also send these in a follow-up email. Um, this is three, three-part series, and now we've completed all three parts. And you can actually see that um, you can view these on YouTube anytime. So I will send all three of these YouTube links, including what Rob covered today. Um, and so you can watch these anytime at your leisure and share them with friends and all that good stuff. So that. You know, we should be good to go there. Also, the books of both Dr. Satino, of Rich Frank, of Jim Hornfisher, they're all available in our store. And if you use the code WEBINAR in the checkout screen, you get an extra 20% wow. off. Ooh. You're not <laughs> so, buying a book. You're making a yes. contribution to my daughter's scholarship book. <laughs> there you go. People. So thank you. There you go. So uh, anyway, um, so that, that's also an available resource for you as well. We really enjoyed connecting um, with great. the folks uh, these last uh Few months, and of course today, uh, we had a we had a blast. So maybe we'll do maybe we'll do this again for another. I hope so. I love the questions. I, I, <laughs> so, I, if I had another five hours right now, we could sit there and continue. Yeah, love seriously. <laughs> so yeah, there's always some great questions. So we love your participation and feedback. Um, when you folks close out of this live webinar room, you will see a survey pop up from GoToWebinar. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, just to you know kind of know how we're doing and what you'd want next. Uh, we're always taking that input and feedback, so um, we'd love to hear from you. I think actually. For me, uh, I think that's all I got. Rob, you got anything else? Dr. Satino, oh, yeah, so. <laughs> mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. You're out, right? Thanks so much. No, I, you know, what? this, this museum, uh, it, it really exists because of the interest and the fascination and the obsession you all have with World War II, and that's an obsession we share here. And I got to say this, 
It's never going to end. People always say, do you think the interest in World War II will, will sometimes begin to wane? And because of people like you, I think the answer to that is a definite no. So <laughs> take care, everyone. Great day today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. And uh, from Dr. Satino and Chrissy here at the museum, uh, thanks so much. And we'll see you for the next one, okay? Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.